Alright ladies and gentlemen, I know it's been a while, I know a lot of people have been asking about it, but today I'm sad to announce I can't review the Pixel Slate. I can't review this product because in my mind, and I know this is up for debate, but in my opinion, this is not even a product. What Google puts in the tablet section of their website is not exactly a device that they intended to be used out of the box the way it is. It's simply not a cohesive actual product, and I'll be going into more details throughout the video, but to the people that were expecting some giant long video or Apple Sheep Overdrive or something major, you're not gonna get it today because while I'll be going through my experience with the Pixel Slate, it is definitely not a device that I would consider even a competitor. It's not even a device I would consider telling people is competition or telling people is even a player because the amount of underthinking, the amount of non-planning, and the amount of oversight when making the Pixel Slate completely baffles me in the sad fact that there are people out there that actually bought this and consider it a major competitor or consider it a worthy device is honestly mind-boggling to me and I really have tried to listen and watch several videos or several reports or blogs about why the Pixel Slate would be a worthy purchase to someone and I can't find much reason in it. I can only think that subconsciously it probably has a lot to do with people upset with the way Apple's doing things whether it be devices too thin, no headphone jack, iOS limitations and they see that and basically anytime another major competitor even remotely attempts to make a competitor everyone immediately is rooting for it because it's the underdog and they want Apple to be put in their place and they want Apple to have some type of major competition so they will unnecessarily boost up and root for devices that logically can't even hold up anywhere close to what Apple has been offering with the iPad game so I think a lot of the love that the Pixel Slate got online was was undeserved because people almost have a pity for it. They feel so sorry for it that they feel like someone needs to be a fan of this. So they're gonna try their very hardest to find anything good they can find with it. But if you're expecting some kind of shocker that the Apple sheep actually likes the Pixel Slate, no, there's no surprise today. Without further ado, here's why the Pixel Slate to me is not even a product. Let's begin. <laughs> So you've, probably watched, so you've probably watched several Pixel Slate videos out there and you've noticed the lag. Particularly in MKBHD's video, he is known of being a fan of the Pixel branding and the Pixel line, but still he was ruthless to the Pixel Slate showcasing how bad the lag gets on that base model that is powered by an Intel Celeron chip. And may I remind you, the base model starts at $600. That's before you get the keyboard and trackpad case that Google expects everyone to buy with it. And that is not an exaggeration. You know, sometimes when I review the Surface Go or I review the Surface Pro, the Microsoft devices, I notice that in tablet mode, there's really not much they can do. They're not terribly capable and they're expecting everyone to buy a keyboard and mouse to actually get some work done on them. And while I still stand by that, and that's very true, those issues are compounded and exponentially worse when it comes to the Pixel Slate because of how little they put time and thought into the fact that maybe someone out there wants to buy a Pixel Slate and not a keyboard and trackpad to go with it because after all Google you do advertise this as a tablet it is not a laptop and in my opinion a touchscreen is not enough for a device to be considered a tablet it has to be a predominantly touch interface in order for it to be considered a tablet if the dominant interface of the product is a keyboard and mouse then it's a laptop okay there's other laptops out there with touchscreens but because the dominant way of interfacing with them is a trackpad and a keyboard that doesn't mean that any laptop with a touchscreen is magically a tablet. To me, particularly if you're selling a product with a touchscreen only, it doesn't come with a keyboard, doesn't come with a mouse, doesn't come with an S Pen, doesn't come with any kind of stylus or anything like that. That means this is by all means intended to be used as a tablet, which is what I did with it. And it did not take long. It did not take a genius. It doesn't take someone who needs to test out every single app or intentionally start looking through the user interface for problems. All it takes is an everyday consumer, someone who just thought, you know, I heard bad things about the Pixel slate and I heard multitasking's bad on it, but I'll try to use it for some daily tasks anyway to find some very clear problems with the user interface. For one, we noticed on day one when I unboxed the Pixel Slate, the locking mechanism is completely different than any other tablet or hybrid laptop tablet I've seen. On an iPad or on a Surface device, when you press the power button and you lock the display, the device is now locked at that point. That's how most tablets work. But because the Pixel Slate was intentionally designed to be locked, 
dock to keyboard and trackpad, and Google was anticipating people were gonna be using this thing as a laptop, not actually a tablet, it behaves by default more like one. So that means that when you press the power button and lock the device, it's not actually locked. You can put this in your bag, you can go about your day, you could put it in a backpack or a purse, someone could steal it, press that power button, and boom, they're already logged into it because you forgot to hold the power button and select lock because by default, pressing power isn't actually locking the device. All it means is, oh, you meant to close the laptop lid. You don't actually want to lock out the device, right? A huge sacrifice of security that most devices never have a problem with. I mean, think of how your smartphone works. When you lock the display, when you press the power button, it is now locked. It's not like someone could take your phone off you, press the power button, and immediately be on the home screen. No, because you turn the display off, the phone is locked. They would need your fingerprint or your face or your passcode to open the phone back again. The Pixel Slate is the first tablet I've ever tested that doesn't work this way. That intentionally acts more like a Chromebook, which says, oh, he just pressed the power button. That means he wanted to close the laptop lid. He didn't actually want to lock and protect his device from anyone who wants to walk by, grab it, or a friend who wants to mess with your device. He has instant access unless you go into Google Chrome settings and manually turn on the option to have the device actually lock when you press a power button, a feature we've had on phones and iPads pretty much since the day biometrics became a thing. So that was first big red flag was clearly Google was not thinking about how the industry works and how security works for most people. The second thing was very quickly realizing that Google anticipated everyone was going to be using the Chrome version of everything when they bought the Pixel Slate. It's a tablet running Chrome OS, but did anyone feel like they were trying to sell you on the idea that Chrome OS was somehow touch friendly? Because it isn't. They didn't do anything. All they did was say that now Android apps can run on Chrome OS devices. That's about it. And when they say Android apps, that means 99% of them are optimized for mobile, not designated for a large touch input device like this. Twitter just looks like a blown up version of the phone app. And I know a lot of people feel that way about the iPad, but there is some optimization done in return. Twitter allows for different split screen multitasking menus when you're on an iPad. Twitter allows for the tweets in the pictures to be in a single line in a column that's much easier to read on an iPad opposed to this where everything is just stretched out and clearly not thought through. So what's the solution? Simply use the Chrome version. Open Google Chrome, open Twitter through that. Even the YouTube app is not installed on this tablet. They expect you to use the desktop version of YouTube that you would see on a laptop or a desktop and not have a keyboard and mouse and just use it with the touch interface, which again is proving my point. They weren't thinking about people using the touchscreen as the primary method of interface. That was not considered. All they were thinking about was, okay, but they'll have the keyboard and mouse, though to save money, we can just not ship the keyboard and trackpad with the device. And that way we can slap four gigs of RAM in there. Intel Celeron CPU starts at $600 because it's made of metal and glass, which makes it premium. And it's got the Google logo on it. So just like the Pixel devices, it's gotta be fairly pricey. In regards to a lot of people talking about the lag and how bad it is, it's definitely worse on the smaller end options. For those curious, I bought the $1,000 Pixel Slate. This has an Intel Core i5 CPU, and I can confirm the lag is not as bad as it is on the Celeron models that MKBHD tested. But keeping in mind, you are now paying the price of likely a really good Chromebook that actually would come with a keyboard and trackpad, or you're paying the price of a 12.9 inch iPad Pro, and the comparison to this in an iPad Pro is like night and day. The fact that I paid $1,000 for a product and just in the user interface, just in the home screen and the menus and multitasking, I am capping out at like 30 hertz, 30 frames a second. I know the display is capable of running 60 because the only time I can ever see 60 frames a second when using the Pixel Slate is if I load up a YouTube video and change the quality to 60 FPS like many people do. But in regards to the user interface, multitasking, split screen, scrolling, even just accessing your apps on the home screen, everything is is 30. Everything is choppy. Just opening a couple apps, immediately you'll start to see that drop in frames. And to answer your questions, no, it doesn't go away when you pay more. Maybe it doesn't freeze for six seconds like the Intel Celeron does, but just because this one has an Intel i5 doesn't mean that it's this smooth, buttery, seamless experience. If you were buying an Android tablet that cost $100, $200, you know what? I'll even leeway a little bit. A $300 Android tablet. I would not be that shocked if the home screen and the user interface kind of averaged out at about 30 FPS. That would be expected, okay? Google doesn't prioritize tablets. It's a very cheap device. It's fairly affordable. No big surprise, okay? Android tablet doesn't have a high refresh rate. But when the starting price is $600 and the configurations go well past 
1500 bucks? That's when I stop letting that be an excuse. That's when I start saying, no, if you're paying $1,000 for a tablet and 80% of the advantages of this tablet are not available out of the box, that means there's something wrong. There's a problem with the product. If you can't hit 60 hertz, something iPhones do, something $300 iPads can do, I don't think it's asking too much to just ask for a clean, fairly smooth, you know, you can make the argument, okay, iPad Pros, it has 120 hertz Pro Motion display. It's beautiful. It's super buttery. It runs great. It's industry leading. We love the iPad Pro display. Okay, case closed. But you can make the argument out there that some people can't tell the difference between 60 and 120. I know a lot of us techies can. When I see 120, it looks so much better than 60. But okay, you can make the argument not a lot of people care about 120. Some people are fine with 60. But to settle in the beginning of 2019 with a $1,000 device that cannot hit 60 FPS in just navigating the user interface, that's not okay. That shows me that there's a problem, particularly because we know the display is capable of outputting 60 when you load a YouTube video, but the home screen chopping, the multitasking lagging, that's not okay. That means there was something that wasn't thought out and they weren't considering a, a lot of things that resulted in a fairly unimpressive product. In my opinion, this product was designed simply as a laptop first, and then at the last minute they decided, let's not ship it with the keyboard and trackpad because then we can say, oh, Google does tablets and we can keep the price lower because it'll be cheaper if we start the Pixel Slate at $600 because then people will go, oh, $599, that's not that bad. But then they'll be like, oh crap, I like a keyboard and trackpad, so how much is it? Oh, $200? So in order to get the baseline minimum experience of the Pixel Slate, you end up spending $800, and that's with four gigs of RAM and an Intel Celeron chip. Go watch Marquez's video if you wanna see what kind of lag and what kind of frame drops you're gonna be experiencing with an $800 product like that. Granted, it's not as bad with the $1,000 device, but it is certainly not excusable. Very simple things are noticeably gone. Like when you open the YouTube app, because this was designed as a laptop first and Chrome OS was not optimized for a touch interface, the app bar at the bottom of the screen covers up the tabs of YouTube. In fact, when you swipe up YouTube to close it, you can see the tabs that you're used to seeing in the YouTube app, like home, trending, subscriptions, things you can have on your phone. If you're switching to a tablet, there should be more screen real estate, more space to have more work get done. Whereas with the Pixel Slate, bizarrely, because of their lack of intuition and their lack of testing out products before they send them out. That's kind of the most fun thing to me about testing Pixel products, reviewing the Pixel 3 or the Slate or the Pixel Book. I feel like I'm the first one using this thing. I'm like the first person who's ever tried to use it as a daily media consumption device. And I'm noticing problems left and right because clearly at Google, they're not thinking about these things. They don't see them. You know why? They don't care that the bottom bar covers up the YouTube tabs? It's because they weren't expecting anyone would try to put the YouTube app on this device. It does support it because Chrome OS supports Android apps. We're good. It's therefore a tablet. We are technically a tablet. But the whole time they're testing it, the whole time they're designing this thing, they're expecting everyone's going to be watching YouTube videos in Google Chrome with a keyboard and a trackpad and using the laptop desktop type experience. Never once considering the idea that someone may spend a thousand dollars on this tablet and may think two hundred dollars for an extra keyboard and trackpad? Uh, no thanks. That's a little bit excessive. This is already a little excessive. So no, I'm not gonna spend an extra 200 bucks just so that I can use Google Chrome all the time. If you want a Chromebook, there are so many better options made by third parties out there. Check out the Samsung Chromebooks. They're like half the price. They come with a stylus. They come with a keyboard and trackpad. They're not as laggy. They have touch screens. You can do everything that the Pixel Slate advertises for a fraction of the price. The other thing about the Slate they advertised was the 3000 by 2000 like this ultra high resolution display, the CPU and the hardware is so bad that it can barely load anything that's actually that high resolution. And don't get me started on the speakers, all right? Google had the audacity to think that they could have a superior speaker system on the slate by making sure that instead of an iPad Pro, which has four, that's not a recent feature, by the way, iPads have had four speakers on them for years now, I think three years now, potentially four. Google was gonna combat the quad speakers on the iPad with two, but the difference with these two speakers is that they're front firing. So because they're front firing, that makes them better, right? Oh no, 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 no. Not at all, not a single bit. And in fact, I feel like I'm the first person to actually listen to these speakers on the slate because I'm not an audiophile, okay? I use AirPods on a daily basis and I think they're the best sounding headphones ever. And a ton of people, I'm sure, disagree with me on that. They're like, Drew, AirPods suck, I hate AirPods. So l let's just get it out of the way. I'm not very picky about audio. It it's not something I need to be like top tier. I don't need audio to always 
always be super crisp. But the fact of the matter that this is a $1,000 device and these front firing speakers literally rattle when playing music. You can hear the woofers or the tweeters or whatever they're using in these things shaking and rattling as you start to play music a little louder on them is quite honestly piercing to the ear and downright embarrassing next to what the iPad Pro's sound quality can boost out. No, they're not front firing, but you'll notice that they are very, very room filling. The speakers you get out of an iPad Pro usually surprise people who don't own the iPad. They turn it up all the way and go, dang, this thing gets kind of loud. And they even have a decent amount of bass to them. No, they're not going to be as good as something that's more of a Bluetooth speaker or a dedicated speaker like a Bose Soundlink or a Beats Pill or anything like that. But for onboard speakers on an iPad, they are pretty dang good and nowhere near, not even in the ballpark of what the front firing speakers on the Slate can do. And I'm honestly surprised I haven't heard that many people complain about it because I find it drastically annoying. I, I think the Pixel 3 XL has better speakers than the Slate. I played a lot of music on the Pixel 3 when I used it for 30 days. The speakers, they're front firing, they're pretty loud. They were a pretty nice feature of the Pixel. I had a lot of other problems with it, but they did not sound as unverified or as untested out as they do on the Pixel Slate. They actually sound broken. It feels like the speakers are shaking on the inside, rattling against the aluminum, and I promise you I'm not making this up. I've tried a couple of times to document it on camera. <laughs> But obviously microphones and how speakers sound changes per device and changes depending on whatever you're listening to this to. But if you ever get a chance to use a Pixel Slate at a store or something, play a song and turn up the volume all the way. The rattling is jarring. And also in regards to just sheer volume, iPad Pros are way louder, way louder, way clearer, better bass, no rattling. These are a joke. These feel like no one even thought about it. Little nitpicky things I'll mention about the Pixel Slate is that for one, it only comes in one size. Okay, so for the people out there that thought the 13 inch iPad Pro was too big and they would rather have the 11 inch iPad Pro. Pixel Slate only comes in one size. It's too bad they couldn't make smaller options for people out there that thought this was a little overbearing. It's also kind of bizarre that Pixel phones have curved corners. They've established that with the Pixel 3. They curved off the displays in the corners on both the 3 and the 3 XL and it looks like the Pixel 3 Lite. But for whatever reason with the Slate, they didn't want to curve the corners. The fingerprint reader on the side is okay. I notice it failing a lot, but I've also had bad experience with fingerprint readers because I have psoriasis. So in regards to the fact that for the same price, in fact, cheaper because of the 11 inch iPad Pro, you can get a tablet with face unlock with face ID, which is far more reliable. And you just have to tap the display to unlock the device. Whereas this, anytime you want to unlock it, you have to make sure you press the power button and you press it with the exact right finger in the exact right way. Because if you don't put it on there the exact way you originally set it up, you have to put in a passcode. Also the passcode for some reason can't be four digits. It has to be six. On the iPad, it can be four. I don't, I don't get it. And frankly, to the people out there that are complaining that Drew, the Pixel Slate was meant to be used with a keyboard and mouse in order to take advantage of all the features. Why didn't you test it with a keyboard and mouse? Well, that's because I already did, okay? You want that video? It's called the Pixelbook Rant because as soon as you actually dock a keyboard and trackpad to this thing, that's all it is. It just becomes the Pixelbook. What's the difference at that point? Just because it's called the Slate and they don't ship the keyboard or trackpad with it doesn't make it a different product. At that point, it's just expensive hardware that's not optimized, that's laggy, that's not even getting 60 frames a second in the user interface. And now you spend $1,200 instead of $1,000. At least the Pixel Book actually starts at $1,000 and includes the keyboard and trackpad. Can you believe the Pixel Slate literally just made me point out a pro to the Pixel Book? I literally just realized that the Pixel Book may have a better option for you than this. I complimented the Pixel Book. That's what this thing made me do. The idea of selling a product that's this unthought out that I cannot stand. There are people out there that would dare call this a two-in-one. You cannot call this a two-in-one if you are calling it one, like two in one regarding to one tablet, one laptop merged together, then your standards of what a tablet is are super dang low. They are under the ground low because you're saying that in regards to a product just being a tablet, all that means is it's a touch screen and you can scroll. It's not necessarily good at scrolling. It's slow. It's not a smooth user interface. Maybe I'm just spoiled because of the iPad Pro display, but being able to just pair a stylus and draw on a touch screen that doesn't instantly say there, it's a tablet 
tablet, and then if you want the option to pair with a keyboard and trackpad, you can use it as a Chromebook. Chromebooks are meant to be cheap. They can't do that much. The operating system is extremely limiting. All it can really do, I will give Google credit where credit is due, the name makes sense, Chrome OS, because it's simply Google Chrome. Everything you do on Chrome OS is just using the Chrome browser, using Google Docs, using YouTube. Every icon on this home screen just opens in Google Chrome. So don't you dare try to call this a two-in-one, okay? This is barely one of a product because you have to spend an extra $200 to make this even a cohesive product. And I know there's already people that are like, Drew, you can boot Linux onto it and then use it. That Buy some cheap Windows laptop. You don't need to spend $1,000 on a device that doesn't come with a keyboard and trackpad just so that you can reinstall Linux onto it and take advantage of hardware. That way, there are so many cheaper ways to do that. Don't act like just because you can run Linux apps on it that somehow justifies the purchase. Yes, my favorite thing to do when I set up a product is immediately say, well, the stock operating system needs to go because it's limiting. And now I got to spend 200 bucks on a case to get a keyboard and trackpad. Don't sell them separately if they are necessity. Stop calling the keyboard and trackpad an accessory to the Pixel Slate because it's not an accessory. This is a necessity. In order to actually use the product the way it was intended, the way it was designed, you have to spend all that extra money. And if I did that, it would just be reviewing the Pixel Book again. And I've already done that. You can watch that video if you haven't already. Pixel Slate's embarrassing and holds up to the Pixel name of not thinking things through, making it out of expensive parts and expecting people to pay top price for it. I hope this flops. I hope Google learns from this. And if you enjoy it and you bought it and you like it, uh, Good for you, man, because you're buying the one tablet where the stylus can't dock onto the side. You know, before the iPads couldn't do that, but now they can. I bet Pro's Apple Pencil too, they, they snap onto the side, it's easy. A $300 iPad can outperform this $1,000 Pixel Book. Let that sink in. To the people who think this is a good product, you should be amazed by the $300 iPad because it's a third the price and it can do way more than this can. It's got LumaFusion, it's got optimized apps, YouTube, Twitter. You can use it without buying a $200 keyboard. The iPad iPad and iOS are actually designed for you to buy, take out of the box and start using. It's not constantly asking and expecting you to dock a keyboard and mouse to it. The smart keyboard, I get it, it's expensive. The folio case for the iPad Pro, I get it, those are expensive too, but the difference is they are accessories, okay? The user interface is still dominantly touch and even that keyboard accessory is just a preference for people out there that would like to type on a keyboard. It doesn't have to change the entire user interface. It by all means is an accessory. Accessory. Allow me to be an example for you. I never buy the keyboard cases for the iPad Pros ever. I've owned the last three generations of iPad Pro and I always use them with the touchscreen and I don't miss out on any features. I don't lose any optimization because I don't buy that case. It's clearly optional for people out there who want to use it, but if you'd like to save your money and just use the iPad the way it comes out of the box, you absolutely can do that and still take advantage of all of the features it comes with. That's what a tablet is. That's what a product is. And in conclusion, this is not a product. In regards to what I like about it, there's no camera bump. I like that. There's, there's no camera bump on the back. That's pretty great. The colors, cool. It's made of nice aluminum. Feels nice in the hand. I like that it has uh, two USB-C ports. You can charge on either side and plug in something else if you need to. I like that. I'd like that to be on an iPad. Uh, you have portrait mode, the, the pixel version of portrait mode on the front and back. That's kind of neat. On the iPad, it's only on the front. It looks 10 times better on the iPad because the cameras on these things are, are, are uh, trash. But uh, yeah, no 4K video recording on here either. Uh, I guess not everyone cares about that, but overall, yeah, no camera bump. That's pretty nice. 10 out of 10 would recommend. I think you guys should buy it. You'd really like it. This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you in the next one.